In this video, I'm going to share seven lessons with you that I learned over the past four months working on various AI projects, making over 100K in revenue for my company. Now, to be clear, this is revenue, not profit. Near the end of this video, I will give a little more insights on how I take on these projects and how I divide this up over the team and what the actual profits are. My name is Dave Ebelaar and I'm the founder of Data Lumina, which is a data science and artificial intelligence coaching and consulting business. Over the past four months, I've been really focusing on generative AI and the possibilities that are now available with large language models. And what I've learned over the past four months, that is what I wanted to share uh, in this video with you that I think will be really helpful for anyone that want to uh, embark on this same journey. So with that out of the way, let's start with lesson number one, which is how do you build these applications? How do you go about it? And <clears throat> without going into all of the technical details, that's not for this video. I want to highly like illustrate the process of how it works. The way to go about this is through a process called retrieval augmented generation. Now, what this all means is basically we convert text unstructured data into a numerical representation that we can then use to perform similarity searches. And how this works now, whenever a user interacts with the AI, with the system, that same question is also turned into uh, a vector embedding. And uh, that will be used to search through the database to find the most relevant pieces of information from a company's internal data. And together with the question, it will be sent to the model itself. And like I've said, this counters uh, a couple of things. So first it counters the training cutoff period from, the, from OpenAI's models. Two, it counters hallucination to some degree. And three, you have much better control over what kind of like outputs and results you can get and expect from your models because you can control the data which uh, is used as the input. And now if you're interested in the technical side of things and really want to learn how you can build applications with these large language models, then make sure to check out my free group Data Alchemy. In there, there are various trainings and resources with videos and instructions and all that will teach you how to get started with data science and artificial intelligence. All right, and lesson number two is how to navigate data privacy. Because usually the first thing that really comes up in a conversation with a, with a prospect potential client is, okay, but what about my data privacy? We're going to share uh, data with these models, but uh, are, are they, is the data going to be used to, to, to train the models? Will it be shared with OpenAI? And we have a very simple solution for that. And that is to use Azure OpenAI. So Azure is Microsoft's cloud platform. And as you might know, Microsoft has a big share in OpenAI. And what they did, and I think this is a really like clever move, is they kind of like made clones available of the open AI models, but you can use them in a protected way where data is kept within your Azure subscription within your Azure tenant. And Microsoft is really transparent about what they do with your data, more specifically what they don't do with your data. So uh, here you can see an overview of uh, things they are not doing. So they're not sharing to our other customers, not sharing with open AI, not used to improve open AI's models, etc. So this is a really good selling point if you wanna do this yourself and maybe implement it in your own company or sell it as a service. This is a way to keep your data private and protected. All right, and then lesson number three is adapting rapidly. So everything that is going on within this world of AI and generative AI, it's all so new and there are a lot of changes happening like every week. So new frameworks come out, things get updated. So this is hard, this is challenging in terms of like, you have to really like stay up to date with, with your learning and you gotta be prepared to dive into something, build something, learn something, and then maybe in like four weeks, there's a better solution and then maybe switch to that or see kind of like what, what the new direction is that you have to go in. So really like from a product perspective, like one year product roadmaps, really from a techno technology perspective don't really make sense because like I've said, things are moving really quickly and I've had it already like multiple times where I was using a, a certain framework, an open source tool, which adds various layers of abstractions, for example, to working with these large language models. And then you have an application and then like 
two weeks later, uh, there's a new update, the whole syntax changes and you can still use the, the old version, it still works, but you kind of like, of course, want to like stay up to date. So if you consider going down this path and also doing these projects, just be prepared, rapid changes, adapt rapidly, continue to learn. And then lesson number four is that it's still all about the data. So while these models, these large language models are pre-trained, meaning that out of the box, they are already quite capable, you still have to provide this context in order to really make useful applications. Like I've explained to you in lesson number one through the process of retrieval augmented generation. So don't be fooled by this notion of pre-trained models thinking that you can skip that part. Keeping your data in check, building solid data, data sets is still required for this. And also if you're a professional maybe that wants to help other companies, really make sure that you do an assessment on that as well. It's still really about quality of the data in will be quality of the data out. Okay, and then lesson number five is start with a proof of concept. So start small. And again, this goes for companies that wanna uh, do something with AI or professionals that wanna help other companies, but really like start small. The fact that all of these technologies and frameworks and solutions are all so new means that there are no like clear cut solutions that will work for, for any scenario. So I kind of like always like to work with, with proof of concepts, but um, I think for this area, this domain is even more important. So you really like want to start small and don't sell like a complete like one year product uh, project, for example, like working out all the details in the beginning and the requirements. No, really take like one kind of like isolated problem that you can tackle with this technology and see if you can really add value. So you really want to work agile here. You want to keep the customer in the loop and focus on rapid feedback cycles to see if the direction you're heading, the application that you're building is actually uh, solving the problem, is actually capable of solving the problem. And now how long should a proof of concept take? Well, really depends on what you're trying to, to accomplish. What we really focus on is usually either like four or, or six weeks, uh, depending on the size. But that should be enough to get all of the information that you need to identify some, some use cases, then prioritize them, and then work out one specific use case to really like get that proof of concept and to basically check whether you can really add value with this technology. Okay, and then lesson number six is how do you transition from proof of concept to production? And this is a tricky one because we're all really just trying to figure out how to actually do this. It's hard to go from POC to production with this, this technology. And one of the main challenges that you'll likely run into is the fact that these large language models are non-deterministic, meaning that every time you have a certain kind of like input, you don't always get the same output. And on top of that, it's also users interacting with the system. So one user might ask a question uh, one way and user B might ask a question another way. So all of these variables will result in uh, various different outcomes over time. And that's why it's really critical to have a solid evaluation system in place. So something like Langsmith, for example, can help you with this. So I've also created a video on that. So check it out if you wanna learn more about that. But you want a way to monitor and evaluate your large language models applications. This, just like you need with classical machine learning models, you also want to monitor them to uh, monitor drift over time, for example. Same is true for these applications. And then finally, lesson number seven is what skills do you actually need to build these solutions? And really what I've found, it leans more towards software engineering, but you still need the mindset of a data scientist. So let me explain. How you build these applications is mostly software engineering, meaning it's a bunch of APIs that you have to connect, you have to set up some data, data sources, and it's really more about like building applications from a software development perspective. But the tricky thing is, like I've explained, it is still a machine learning model that you're interacting with. And since the, the outcomes from these models are non-deterministic, you still need that 
that data mindset, the data science mindset of doing experimentation, figuring out how we can improve the data, running experiments to see how it gets better. Because I think that really like separates data scientists and software engineers, where software engineers are much more used to uh, creating applications in a deterministic way. For example, you create an API and if you send a certain uh, input to that API, you get a certain output or, or data is stored somewhere. It's straightforward in the sense that it's predictable. And as data scientists, we are much more familiar with this notion of uncertainty because when you train machine learning models, you never really know what you're going to get. But to really succeed at a, a project and, and build full-scale applications, you uh, typically need, need various roles, you need various key players. And that's why I also uh, usually like to team up on these projects. So you could really need a data scientist or a machine learning engineer, which could both really work on the AI side of things. But then you would need a software developer to configure the backend and maybe even a front-end developer to create a front-end an application on uh, in which you want to deploy this this application and make it available to the end user but this all depends on the use case that's not not always required so uh, what i've really been doing over the past couple of months is also learning a lot about software engineering kind of like transitioning more towards that because i find it really exciting really interesting and i see this also really as a new opportunity for i've heard heard people talk about the the term new age machine learning engineer this is the machine learning engineer that can work with these large language models and with generative ai so i'm definitely like all in on that i see the huge value the huge potential um, uh, that this can bring mainly, like I've said, because of this notion that it's pre-trained. You still have to provide the data, but the fact that the power is already in, the, in these models and you can use that is just such a huge advantage, especially uh, for small and medium-sized businesses where more classical machine learning uh, approaches and models are, are just not feasible yet. All right, so that concludes the seven lessons that I learned working on various AI projects over the past four months making over 100K in revenue. And now, as I've said, that's revenue, that's not all profit. And I really think if you wanna be successful with this, you really have to partner up. You, you need a team because if you go the route of, of custom development, uh, there's just too much work for one single person alone. So I usually right now take on projects with either like two to four other experts, um, usually combination of, of software engineers, front-end developers and data scientists uh, like myself and take on these projects like that. So in terms of actual profit for my company, that was about 50% of that. Now, this is on top of all the other things that we're still doing. This is really a new area that we're exploring, that I'm exploring. So we still have a lot of other revenue streams going as well. But here you can see how this is very lucrative from a business perspective, of course. So that's 50K profit in four months, not working full time on this. So there is huge potential uh, within this. And I hope that by sharing these lessons for any of you interested in learning more about this as well, taking on your own projects or as a company doing this internally. Like I said, I really hope that this helped. Let me know if you want to learn more lessons like this. There's plenty more stuff that I can share about this, about everything that I've learned. But uh, this is it for now. Make sure to like this video if you found it helpful and then also subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any future videos. So that's it. Thank you all for watching and see you in the next one.